Welcome everyone to the Future of Mental and Behavioral Health. I'm one of your co-hosts, Bambi Francisco Roizen. This is our third breakout session as part of our series on mental and behavioral health. Our main event will be May 27th between 12 p.m. and 4 p.m. So mark your calendars, go to vader.tv forward slash events and you will see the times as well as the speakers. I wanna quickly recognize some partners who support these salons, Addison Young, a commercial real estate company, Scrubbed, a back office accounting firm, Stratpoint, which provides outsourced engineering, advisor, a boutique investment bank, and BetterHelp, which offers virtual therapy. And, and thank you, BetterHelp, for providing the Invent Health community a discount. Use Vator, V-A-T-O-R, uh, at BetterHelp, and you can get half off three months of BetterHelp virtual therapy sessions. So thank you, BetterHelp, for that. So it's May 6th. We have been sheltered in place for nearly two months now. I'm starting to see glimpses of the new normal. For instance, I believe face masks are the new accoutrement. I'm sure people will have greater flexibility to work from home and trying to get telehealth reimbursements will no longer be a burden. But we're not at this new normal yet. We're still currently weighing the costs and benefits of private liberty and public health and whatever will emerge will I'm sure be some workable compromise, but for the purposes of this event, I think I'm concerned not so much what the circumstances will, will be come July, August, September, but our mental state as we open up the economy. At our last breakout session, we discussed this idea and notion of a silent pandemic sort of insidiously developing as we speak. It's a mental health pandemic. And I guess the, the questions we have to ask ourselves is where are we seeing this emerging and how are we preparing ourselves? So joining us to discuss the mental health landscape are Alan Matas, who's the founder and president of BetterHelp. Brian Garrett, he's founding, founder and managing director at Crosscut, Crosscut Ventures. Dr. Nina Vassan, founder and chairwoman of Innovation Lab at the American Psychiatry Association and David Bond, he's Director of Behavioral Health at Blue Shield of California. So before I turn this over to my co-host, I want to briefly remind everyone we are taking questions starting at 345. So you can use the Q&A box and go ahead and ask your questions. You can even post them in the chat area and we can start getting them lined up. So please, please, uh, um, be open to asking questions and, and getting involved in the conversation. So with that, I'd like to introduce my co-host, Dr. Arshana Dubey. Uh, she has a few words to share. Arshana? Yes, hi. Um, thank you, Bambi. And uh, I'm really excited to join uh, the group of panelists that we have today, especially as we embark on this journey of reopening our economy. So first we took care of lives and now we're taking care of livelihoods and both of them come with a share of burden onto our health and well-being and most importantly mental health um, and behavioral health, how we are seeing. Um, I am uh, preparing a large organization to bring it back to work. And as we are seeing, we are also seeing states starting to open up and anxieties around going back to normalcy um, are spiraling up and snowballing. Um, so I would like to, you know, with that, with those thoughts, uh, further our discussions with the panelists and um, start the conversation. Before I jump into that, I would like to also welcome Mark, who is joining us from the UCSF Digital um, Health Hub. And uh, maybe Mark has some more insights to add on to our discussion today. Hi, right, thanks, Arshana. So uh, welcome. I'm sorry that we can't be in Mission Bay, which was the intent uh, for, you know, for today's event. And we're hopeful that we're going to be able to be back on campus in September at this point, but we don't know. Um, there's no question that at UCSF and elsewhere, mental health and behavioral health have basically have catapulted to probably the number one uh, area of concern, interest, expense, and, and the like because of, uh, because of the virus. Um, it's really uh, stripped a lot, stripped the resources of UCSF away. It's basically, but at the same time, 
it's creating incredible opportunities for these wonderful new mental health companies that, uh, that were really digital health companies that were all founded in the last few years. A number of them have got, you're gonna hear from them today, a number of them recently funded. And these companies are literally tripling their revenues and their, and their metrics this year because of the demand. So that's sort of the, the lemonade that comes out of the lemons here. But on behalf of UCSF and UCSF Health Hub, and we're now a, a 15,000 person strong you know, organization, I wanted to welcome you to this. Um, we have also our other various events. We have a, something called Home to Hospital event, which is, which is next week. And if you're not a member of, of uh, UCSF Health Hub, you should be. And then we have our award show, of which uh, Bambi and Oshana are, are, are active participants in. So with that, I want to hand it off to all of you and uh, thank you for coming here. Well, yeah. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, and uh, w with that, we want to jumpstart the conversation. And uh, like I talk about in most of my uh, current conversations in large group setting, that COVID-19 is not if affecting most of us, thankfully, but the stress is. So with that, um, we would like you to introduce each one of you introduce yourself and, and share how your businesses are being impacted by COVID-19. Um, so I would begin with Brian, because I see your screen, the first on my right side. Look at the draw. Yes, you get the draw. Sure. Uh, uh, thanks for having me. Um, I run a, a early stage venture fund in, based in Southern California. We invest nationally. Uh, but mostly our focus is on backing entrepreneurs with ideas and visions and concepts that we think are um, pretty revolutionary and can scale into big businesses. So uh, I've been doing this for um, something like 20 years now. Uh, left the Bay Area in 2001, moved back to Los Angeles where I was born and raised and eventually started Crosscut with two other partners in uh, August of 2008, right as we headed into the global financial crisis. So. I've seen a few of these, nothing like this, of course. And um, I guess I feel fortunate in that my actual business, the running of a venture firm, um, has not been significantly impacted in the way many true small businesses and service-oriented businesses have. Um, the impact on us as general partners in a fund has really been in working our relationships with our entrepreneurs, to help them make the right decisions about how they can keep their companies surviving or hopefully thriving in a post-COVID world. And unfortunately, what that means is primarily headcount reductions and layoffs and the um, stress and anxiety that comes from having to make those decisions or having to support an entrepreneur that has to make those decisions has really been the biggest way that COVID has impacted our fund. Thank you. you. You're my next candidate onto the screen. You're on mute, Nina. Yeah, I, I'm unmuting myself. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Nina Vossen. So to give you a little background, um, I am the chair of innovation for the American Psychiatric Association. I have a few different hats. Primarily, I'm a psychiatry professor at Stanford where I run Stan uh, Brainstorm, which is Stanford's lab for mental health innovation, where we're really looking at this intersection of innovation, entrepreneurship, and mental health, um, and technology, of course. And um, then clinically, I treat patients, I'm a general adult psychiatrist treating patients both at Stanford, as well as I have a private practice, Silicon Valley Executive Psychiatry, where I focus on primarily executives and entrepreneurs. So thinking about that question of how has this affected business, um, in these kind of two settings, I think first, you know, we are an academic lab focused on mental health technology. From that perspective, I think um, similarly um, to Brian, you know, what we're actually seeing is this huge spike in um, companies of, of all stages from these early stage, st stage startups all the way through the big companies, the big tech companies here in Silicon Valley, all who are really interested in trying to figure out how do they best address mental health um, in this time of COVID, uh, looking not only at the changes in terms of what's going on now, things like, you know, the increase in telehealth, increase in digital tools that people want to engage in, as well as a lot of companies and organizations that are trying to figure out what does this mean for the coming months and years. And at Brainstorm, you know, we're sort of a, 
um, mix of an academic lab studying this field as a whole and also a consultancy where we work with various entities from you know tech companies to payers to government organizations to figure out mental health strategy and, and where does the digital role and so what I'm seeing is actually as I said just a big increase of folks really wanting to understand what does this look like and how do I best prepare for it. Then clinically, um, you know, clinically, I have two sort of different subsets of populations at Stanford, a little, little bit of everyone, um, and then in my private practice, focused primarily on executives. Um, what I'm really seeing there, one is a, 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 like a spike in uh, demand, which, you know, we, we kind of um, already expected, and I know you talked about a bit last week as well. Um, and what's really striking me, I think, is just the pathology of what I'm seeing. Significant increases in depression, suicidal ideation, and substance use, um, which, uh, you know, unfortunately does tie with what we see in past financial crises, past um, trauma situations, past quarantines, and um, really looking and understanding clinically what's going on with folks on a daily basis. Um, initially, I think there was a lot of resilience at play and people were responding very well and positively. And just in the last couple of weeks, I think you're seeing um, in some ways that downturn where the mental health side of it is really, really coming through and symptoms are um, re reaching, reaching a peak. Thank you. And that's, yeah, that's, that's quite um, staggering. Um, yeah, it has been. David, how is how is Blue Shield and the mental health is? Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, my, my name is David Bond, and I'm the director of, of behavioral health at Blue Shield. I've been in behavioral health for a little over 20 years. Um, at my clinical background is I have a specialty in pediatric trauma, so also sexual and physical abuse, domestic violence, um, and exposure to community uh, and migration trauma quite a bit. Um, so. Uh, but I would say the impact to business uh, from a payer perspective now that I'm on the other side of it, um, we have a responsibility, of course, to take care of our membership, um, uh, our provider networks, and our internal employees. So you have these, large, these, these three major groups. Uh, for members, we see a um, really interesting kind of shift from uh, what we expect to see in people who are losing commercial coverage because of having been laid off or employers that are, you know, having some additional layoffs and whatnot, and then a shift into what we expect to be um, growth in our Medi-Cal population, um, which is Medicaid for California, um, over the next several months, and uh, really kind of depending on, like, what's happened with CalFresh and trying to navigate, like, uh, with the huge spike in CalFresh applications, that that's likely to be followed with a very large spike in Medi-Cal applications and making sure that those um, provider networks can sustain the, in the, the growth there. Um, so it, it's also very interesting, though, that COVID-related treatment has spiked in, in immensely, as you can imagine, but elective treatments and procedures have had a huge uh, decrease. So there are some provider groups that, that their business has, has really plummeted of sorts, might need some additional kinds of financial support where other businesses have had significant increases. And then for membership, um, you know, I, I really want to speak specifically to behavioral health. I think Dr. Vassan really hit it on the head, and particularly what I'm seeing is a spike in substance use disorder, a need for a, a substance use disorder condition treatment. Um, really complicated for people in the recovery community, for example, to access groups um, you know, where it's, it's very complicated to do so online, particularly for a Medi-Cal population, which, which is less likely to have access to the digital um, platforms to, to engage, to be able to use video as well. Um, so we also have a, you know, a real need for intensifying partnerships with people who are in communities doing the work. Um, so I might be able to talk about that one in a bit um, as we get into some of the additional questions. But um, I, I think what I, what I would also say clinically, uh, piggybacking off of something that Dr. Hassan said is, um, there, there's a, a, I think people's resilience now is really relevant to their baseline resilience. So I, I for example, my, my partner and I are fortunate enough to have a guest room that doubles as an office for me to work from home. So it's not a problem for me to come in here and have a private space when I need it. But we also see, particularly among Medi-Cal population, you have families of four to eight people who might be sharing a studio apartment that are sheltering in place. So their baseline, their tolerance for family frustration is going to be very different. So we really have to sort of navigate and help through our social services department how to help folks navigate some of those challenges as well. 
Thank you. Thank you. Alan? Yes, hi, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Lil Matas. I'm the founder and president of BetterHelp. BetterHelp is an online counseling platform. Uh, we connect people looking for mental health help with licensed therapists uh, nationwide. Uh, we have a network of over 8,000 therapists um, and we facilitate around 3 million sessions uh, every month. Um, some of them are messaging, some of them are text, uh, real-time chatting, and some are phone and some are video. Uh, we've been around for uh, six years and were acquired by Teladoc Health in 2015. Um, to the question of how uh, COVID-19 impacted us, I think last time I was in, in the small panel, uh, at the first event of uh, Invent Health back in March, I said that uh, we definitely see a uh, increase of demand uh, that was in March and I think a lot of change since then. So this increase in demand became a crazy peak. A surge in demand, we can definitely say now that we're 3x, 4x of normal levels of uh, new people signing up for online therapy, most of them around depression, stress, and anxiety. We also see a lot more usage from uh, existing members, which was to me a little bit more surprising. So we see people who have been in therapy for six months or more uh, and are just using the service more. The way the service is built is um, um, if you're a consumer paying it yourself, you pay a flat fee and then you can. Um, uh, have interactions throughout the month with your uh, counselor over messaging as much as you want. And then you can have also weekly live sessions over phone and video. So we should go up and down based on needs and we definitely see a lot more usage, even from people who have been in therapy for a long time. Um, so it's definitely, uh, we've seen this increase actually in, in April, much more than in March. But you expect on March things just started and but people may have, I thought this is going to go away soon. And in April it hit that this is here to stay and it's, it's a much bigger issue than just a temporary, okay, we'll stay home for a week and it will uh, go away. Um, so our biggest challenge now is actually how we accommodate the demand with healthy supply of, of therapists. We added uh, in April over 900 therapists uh, and in March and in May we're uh, in trajectory to add 1500 therapists. Uh, just to meet the demand that we have now from uh, consumers. Are you, are you seeing um, better recruitment of therapists um, as they are also not having their physical presence, so they are more likely to partner with you? So interesting that that has changed. So March, actually, we've seen a lot easier to recruit therapists because you had a lot of therapists uh, who uh, kind of lost or thought that they're going to lose their uh, current clients and so we saw a lot more uh, applications coming in but also current therapists open their availability more so therapists who worked on the platform and worked with five clients now worked with 15 clients um, a little bit tapered off in April probably because a lot of therapists uh, found that they can actually keep working with some of their existing clients over telehealth uh, which is something they haven't thought that they could do um, um, so we do see still more interest, uh, but definitely the, the demand side is, is just such a huge spike, uh, that this change our approach about therapists. Like I was, I, I used to say until, uh, a month ago that, um, the problem is always on just on the demand side. Like we have enough therapists, uh, uh, and, and enough supply to, uh, to meet the demand at any given time. Um, and this is like the first time in the six years of our existence that we say we need to actually go and market to, to therapists and get uh, more therapists on board in, in proactive ways. Until now, we're kind of spoiled with just the amount of application we got organically and naturally was, was more than enough to, to meet the demand. You know, we did a survey and I think everyone filled that out who registered. We had about 200 people registered. So we did a survey asking everyone what was their preferred way of treatment and i think it was therapy was pretty much up there um and meditation other types of apps uh well below that so they people really want to have an interaction with somebody to, to speak to someone to, to, to speak with somebody and surprisingly community groups or community support groups were actually a little bit lower but a one-on-one -on -one with a therapist was something that uh, people really wanted. So David, along those uh, lines, 
are you are you expanding the number of therapists you're having in your in your system or to meet your population particular the particularly the medicaid population what how do you how do you service them so we've actually um uh, and i'm glad that you asked i actually received a new report on monday we actually have had more um therapy telehealth appointments and um in the in q1 of this year than we did in all of 2019. Um, we've actually had a higher number we have had not only a higher number of um, telehealth appointments that were for therapy um, but we've had a higher number of unique users for telehealth appointments for therapy just in q1 of this year than we did in all of 2019. Um, but i would say the piece that has, um, at first we were like, gosh, we're really going to have to expand our telehealth provider network. But fortunately, the state um, changed the definition of telehealth last month, might have been late March actually, to include phone, telephone only based contact. So now providers are able to have just a phone call and bill for it, where before they had to use, you know, HIPAA compliant technologies to have that. Uh, billable service interaction. So actually our entire network that was willing to use the telephone for a therapy session became a telehealth provider. That's great. And have you had you have you had to add on new therapists or um, well, we actually, uh, we, we haven't had to expand the network as yet. There hasn't been um, demand that we weren't able to meet within timely access standards. We did um, expand. We had a, another service called, uh, called Teladoc, which is our uh, uh, behavior uh, telehealth, which gives immediate access to licensed health professionals. We were able to expand that to include behavioral health as well. So that was an additional system that we brought in, but our direct contracted network now did not need significant expansion. So Brian, being the VC on the panel along with Mark, but what are you seeing in terms of, not to say that you should be opportunistic during this time, but uh, we are looking for new innovations that can help us either uh, expand access to services, mental health services. And we do look to you, health plans look to you to uh, fund these new innovations. What are you seeing that could expand mental health services? Uh, and, and maybe you've already invested in some, and as Mark mentioned, Mark, you could probably mention some of yours as well. Um, you're probably seeing a ton of demand. So, uh, so Brian, are you seeing demand for some of the mental health companies that you have invested in? And what are some areas that interest you now? Sure. Um, yeah, there's absolutely uh, tailwinds from this that are really having a positive impact on certain businesses and, and destroying others. And so it's that balance of, uh, of you know, how to navigate these waters that we're constantly looking at. Um, I have a partner who came out of uh, Techstar Cedar Sinai. She does all of our healthcare tech investing. We've been pretty active in that realm, um, but way more active now post COVID. And the types of things that we've been involved in are, um, you know, virtual health, telehealth platforms for various um, sufferers of certain diseases. So hypothyroidism is, uh, is a massive community, 30 million sufferers in the US, uh, primarily female. They need consistent blood tests and testing various hormonal levels. Um, very hard to get access to endocrinologists. So uh, our company Paloma Health is able to do that in a virtual tele, tele platform and, and really bring a better experience to that, um, to that suffering uh, patient base. Um, another company I was on a call with today called Robin Care doing cancer concierge, so virtual cancer treatment uh, for self-insured employers. And um, what I've been hearing on the trends there is that more of these employers, instead of having on-site clinics to become a perk or a benefit for their employees, they're actually looking at the, the, the virtual delivery of care in every format um, because it's safer and it's cheaper and it's equally as effective, I think some of the data is starting to prove. So we're looking at a bunch of those types of businesses right now. Um, and certainly anything that reduces, sorry, that's my dog in the background. Um, Anything that reduces uh, the, the, you know, the, or helps improve the cleanliness of the air, various solutions for actually, you know, 
catching and destroying the virus, at-home blood tests, various things to test for antibodies. There are all sorts of things coming out of the woodwork that I think have real momentum from the payer and the provider, as well as the consumer. There's just lots of demand there because everyone's living with this anxiety. Um, mental health, uh, definitely increasing demand, as everyone already noted. Um, for us, we have a, a company called Kensho Health, which is a holistic health platform. So it's beyond meditation and other forms of alternative therapies for various treatments. Um, they've seen an unbelievable uh, kind of inbound spike to what I would call more community-based, which has really been the, the uplifting part of this. Uh, the LA tech community has really rallied as a whole and all entrepreneurs have come together through various mechanisms of communication to say, what do you need and how can I help you? And what are the various forms of solutions that are out there that we can leverage? And so I've seen just a really nice community dynamic form across LA about helping each other find the resources necessary to get through these times. Yeah, Bambi, if I could, I could add to that. I'm, uh, I echo Brian, um, a few things. Um, on top of what I do at UCSF, I'm also a venture capitalist. Um, I made a, a few investments recently. Uh, one of um, one is called Neuroflow. And Neuroflow is a uh, is uh, a system that uh, is used by the VA and used by uh, hospitals that allows uh, that augments the therapist um, with an app that the um, the patient uses, so that therapists can manage more patients and can track basically patient behavior remotely. And um, needless to say, because everything is remote lately, uh, neuro, it's been a, Neuroflow has been deployed. Um, you know, it's had the same type of, uh, you know, 3X uh, deployment that Alon saw. Um, in addition, you know, what's, I'll take a step back from a UCSF perspective, behavioral health and mental health, yes, tele, telehealth, is, telehealth is everywhere. It's, but telehealth is really everywhere there probably will not be a procedure done within two or three years at UCSF without a tell us something associated with it. So when you think about patient engagement, which is really, you know, in a, instead of adjacent to telehealth, the new model is going to be sure there is, you are going to have a procedure done at the hospital, but you are going to have software that helps you before the procedure, after the procedure, you're going to have multiple online visits, and you're going to have a much more efficient experience. You're going to get through the hospital more quickly, which is obviously everyone's goal. It's UCSF's goal. We don't want people staying any longer than they need to stay. And it's a, naturally the, the caregivers, the patients, and the family's goal to go home. And so one of, that's one of the reasons we're having this um, home to hospital series that starts next week, which is how basically COVID has changed everything in telehealth and remote diagnostics. And so I echo everything that Brian's been saying that this is a bigger than obviously behavioral health scenario, but it just so happens that it's probably most important today in behavioral and mental health. I think, well, you know, we're, we're hosting as well, uh, the three of us are hosting our Invent Health event on virtual care. So yeah. it so happens we decided to focus on the future of mental and behavioral health as well as virtual care in the first six months of 2020. Uh, right. So we, we also are on that uh, bandwagon. We definitely yeah. want virtual care is here to stay for sure. But let's take, um, I, I, wanna, I wanna take a deep dive, deeper dive into the, the um, what's happening with say the um, patients. And everyone has talked about how we were seeing increased demand, maybe we're seeing increased demand for more therapy sessions, um, more anxiety, um, maybe there's more suicidal ideation, there's depression, there's, I, I want to take a little bit of a deeper dive in what's the, what are, what are kind of the root causes behind that? There's so many reasons why somebody can be depressed, whether it's, as David said, they're all living in a box because they just, and they can't get out, or they're living in a box alone, or they're living in a box with four other people, and it's tight quarters, or they're living in a box alone, or they're, uh, they can't manage, um, they can't manage their kids, and there's way too much. So talk a little bit about the details. Nina, you can talk about that in terms of what are we actually seeing? What's the root cause behind some of these uh, episodes that you're seeing? 
Yeah. Um, well, the answer is really, I think there's a multitude of things that are it, uh, leading to the increase in anxiety and all these other symptoms that we talked about, depression, substance use. And, and then actually another thing that we haven't yet addressed is trauma. Um, and I mentioned this because I think that collectively as a country right now, if not really as a world, we are going through a shared trauma. And what we have started to see now and will continue to see in the coming months is um, when we look at that whole spectrum of like post-traumatic stress disorder being the most severe part of that spectrum all the way through, you know, lighter elements that there are multiple symptoms of trauma that folks have started to really express. And um, that's something that is going to be, um, you know, I, th I think in, if we think about how we need to be addressing mental health issues and what um, that's sort of its own component as well. But let me go back and answer your, your first question. Why is it that this is occurring? Um, multitude of issues, as I say, first is, you know, just acknowledging where we are right now and the lack, the, the unknown, the immense number of changes that we've gone through, right? And we, we evolved as, you know, human beings to be able to change and be able to adapt to change. Yet the, um, the magnitude of change that we've had to deal with, not only in our environment, right, going from outside to now sheltering in place, but then um, looking financially, looking um, from multiple perspectives around, um, you know, culture and society and how things look so different today than they did. So being able to adapt, having to, being forced to adapt so quickly um, makes it very, very hard. And I think a lot of the pre-existing conditions that are there or pathologies that are already in place, those have gotten worse. And then folks who never, where mental health was never on their radar and likely may never have had a mental health struggle, even over the course of their lifetime, those folks are now experiencing immense level levels of anxiety, huge amounts of insomnia, and, and things like that. So um, I, I break it down into that population because I think there's first the people who are already at risk because they're living in a mental health, they're living in a condition where they are struggling with their mental health. And then there are all these new people um, who, who would not be at risk, but because of the environmental elements are struggling. And so um, again, back to why I think uh, there's, there's um, all of these kind of circumstances. And, and when we think about why anyone is sick, we think about a combination of three things, biological, psychological, and environmental. And medically, we call this the biopsychosocial model of disease. Mm -hmm. And so the, if we take that social slash environmental, that's the element that we've all been going through now. And as I said, you know, I mean, biggest changes in our entire lifetime, right? So that kind of really equates for that. Um, but then beyond that, I think that um, there is this, as I said, shared collective trauma, which really brings in a psychological element. Um, and then um, as these interplay, I think that's kind of what ends up leading to so many, um, so many struggles. And I know one of the things that you mentioned, uh, Bambi, was around parenting and all the, the huge increase in stress that parents are facing in terms of knowing what to deal with, what to do with their children, how to take care, and how does that then help them take care of themselves? Um, you know, these are just questions that no one's really had to answer before. And so having so many new stressors come about um, and then not having the regular um, support system to help deal with those stressors, right? Um, most people's support is completely gone away. And support means a lot of things. Support might mean like going to, you know, going out with your friends on Friday night or having a mom's group that meets regularly or even just your coworkers and, you know, that water, that water cooler conversation all the way through more formal support like AA groups, um, it's gone. So when we look at how we stay resilient, we've lost a lot of those because of the current environment that we're in. Um, and so sort of, like, I, think, I think it's a little, it's a mix of all of those that have really led to why we are, why we are where we are right now. Yeah, and, and it, it's very powerful, like how the social support that people had, and they were treating their, you know, subclinical depression, anxiety, PTSD, or panic disorder, uh, that support system falling apart is quite impactful for, and th that's emerging some of that um, unmasking of some of those me mental illnesses. I also feel on the flip side of it, um, I, I'm noticing that people are collaborating and joining. Um, so, so there is this element of like, yes, there's a pandemic induced anxiety and depression that is surging itself but there is there's other element of like and we are in this together um also is a positive uh, flip side to covid19 uh collectively impacting every socioeconomic person and it is creating this level of um, unifying our efforts and helping each other out so 
So there is that positive element too I want to highlight. Uh, people are helping the neighbors who are older or high risk. Um, the, uh, the next door is starting to roll out some of the programs in which people are helping out with grocery pickup for at-risk provider, at-risk neighborhoods and, um, and how helping out the takeout joints like uh, restaurants and paying them extra for, for their uh, work um, so those are those are positive aspect of how people are harnessing onto their resiliency and and they're being positively uh, impacting their surround system. So uh, yeah, I, I don't want to sound all doom and gloom around <laughs> around COVID nineteen, but there is there is some elements of positive in there too. I, I couldn't agree more with the other two clinicians who just spoke. It was funny, like I kept thinking things, and then you both said it better than I would have said it too. So I. Um, I, I think we're very, very much aligned. But I also kind of, uh, and um, I also kind of want to put in sort of the ecological frame of what we're really dealing with in May of 2020 is that it's an election year. There's the frustrations and anxieties that have kind of torn ideologically different values apart during the 2016 election are rearing their heads now. And there's sort of the distinction between a liberal versus a conservative view of the approach to coronas, uh, coronavirus uh, prevention and treatment and when we're ready to go back to work and what the president is saying versus what certain members of Congress are saying and, and medical professionals. And so it's like these compounding layers of stress that is exactly what I think Dr. Vassan was talking about was like a, a, a global feeling of, of being traumatized. Um, everyone's screens are sort of frozen. So at first I was like, no one's nodding in agreement. No one's shaking their head. <laughs> um, but uh, in fact, my Zoom has gone away, but I think that I'm still there. Um, yes, you're talking. Yes. Okay, great. So, um, but I, uh, the, the, only, the last thing I just wanted to put an exclamation point behind was something that, Dr., uh, that both, uh, both of the other uh, two clinicians were saying was a lack of access to our previously existing coping strategies that we knew to be effective. And developing new coping strategies is extraordinarily difficult. And it's, com it's really complicated when you even get into a therapy situation. It's like, well, what has helped you to feel better in the past? And everything that you think about is something that you don't necessarily have access to right now. Um, so developing those new strategies can be quite, quite complicated. And I think that is probably a, a really strong focus of clinical attention in these additional therapy sessions that we've been seeing or uh, a, a significant contributors to the challenges and conflicts that people are facing. Well, let's, let's be forward thinking then and, and think about what we, what we can add to our arsenal. I mean, we have Zoom's been great. Right? But there's only so many Zoom conversations you can have. And we have BetterHelp, which is offering virtual therapy sessions. But there could be other things that we could bring on that could repl replicate those social structures we've had, support systems we've had in the past. And, and we'll have those support systems in the past again. But we might have to social distance while we're doing that. That's going to be a little weird. We're going to be all with masks. That's going to be odd. So we can't really that, be that intimate. But I guess as, as we think about it, then how can we how can we replicate um, these social structures on top of just the virtual therapy sessions that BetterHelp is already offering? So maybe Alon, what are you doing as a to enhance some of your enhance your your services? Or, or maybe you're just so inundated now that all you're doing is just providing it. <laughs> it's yeah, well, our whole approach is, is, is to stay very focused on the um, classic individual therapy provided one-on-one -on -one with a licensed therapist the same way that it's being done in brick and mortar for uh, years and years. And the tried and true uh, approach has changed the, uh, what we're disrupting is not therapy itself, it's uh, the delivery mechanism and make it more accessible, more affordable and more convenient. Um, so we're not trying to kind of change the model, um, but I, I think uh, we're talking about the increase in, in demand for, for therapy, uh, and that's obviously leading some of the increased demand for online therapy in general, but the increase in demand in online therapy is far outpacing just the, the increase in demand for therapy. And one way to look at it, you can open Google Trends and uh, type in therapy, and you see a kind of a very small a moderate increase over the last uh, couple of months, but if you type online therapy, it's doubling uh, or even more. Um, so beyond just the, the uh, and I think that's an, everything that was said here was is absolutely true uh, with the increased stress and anxiety and, and loss of support system. That's definitely pushing people 
from a subclinical uh, that they're talking with uh, friends and, and neighbors to realizing they need to talk with, uh, with a professional. But I think there's another layer to that. Uh, one is, or two layers. One, obviously, the inability now to talk with the therapists in their office or even sometimes with friends and family. But another one is, I think you mentioned Zoom. Um, I think there is a, a pivotal shift in consumer perception and consumer receptiveness to uh, have deep communication online. My wife never used Zoom until four weeks ago. I don't think she knew what Zoom is. Now she's practically every evening in, in Zoom. Um, I think there is there's, um, people that were kind of on the fence or even uh, pushing back on, on doing things like therapy that's uh, doing it online. Now out of no choice or out of finding out that doing things online can be actually be more meaningful than just buying things on Amazon, uh, uh, changing. And, and uh, I think this is important uh, because it's, it's not just a short-term immediate thing because the shelter in place will go away, hopefully in the next uh, few weeks and, and the economy will come back and things will get back to normal either weeks or months or a year from now. But I think the, the fundamental change of how digital health is perceived, how doing telehealth, how doing things online, um, uh, for things like counseling and therapy, that's going to be uh, stay with us for forever, basically. So we're not going to see, uh, we're a different industry now, a different offering now uh, in consumer perception. I think that's uh, what brings a lot of the extra demand beyond just needing more therapy. Yeah. You know, at, um, oh, go ahead. No, no, no. So, uh, so <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, I, I, I work with a um, new startup that just launched actually about a month ago called Real, and it's a New York based uh, mental health startup specifically for women. And they were actually going to be launching an in person uh, facility. They were kind of like going to be this mix of like the wing and Peloton for women's mental health. Um, and then, of course, this happened. And so, literally, over the course of eight days, completely shifted, built out, built out a whole digital offering um, of multiple components, including one on one checkups events and salons and um, what we've seen there actually I think is, um, is is something I really wanted to talk about right now which is group therapy um, when we think about resources collectively as a country in terms of the resources we have and the sheer number of therapist hours we have that all at the end of the day is the big bottleneck right so when we're thinking about how do we appropriately scale mental health from a systems perspective anything that's dependent on like FTE or a number of hours is sort of like an inherently gonna you know it, it's a flaw in a us being able to really, really maximize our utility. And so what I like a lot about group therapy is that, um, and when we look at the research, you know, group therapy is actually just as effective of, uh, as one-on-one -on -one therapy. So I think the research is looking over a 12-week period, having one hour one-on-one -on -one sessions with the therapist versus being in a group, um, that you actually see the outcomes are the same. Um, and more importantly, outcomes are the same with then like, you know, one-eighth or one-twelfth the number of clinician hours. So, um, and, and you know, there are multiple elements of that. You know, you lose some elements of the one-on-one -on -one attention, but then you gain the group perspective and multiple people to have as a support system and everything in the group. Um, and so I think that um, why, but so, so that's, that's, we've known that for a long time though, right? We've known that group therapy is incredibly effective and makes a lot of sense from a systems perspective. Why has it not been successful in the past? Because we've tried to have it in an in-person setting and everyone here is very busy and I, you know, we'll, we'll tell you, come on, who's been able to make like a 7 p.m. at like for 12 weeks in a row for anything, right? Like that's pretty near impossible. Moreover, getting the same like five, 10 or 12 people to make it at that same time. It just not, doesn't happen um, versus now. I mean, and we're in a little bit of a honeymoon phase, right? Because we are all home now, but be, be uh, offering group therapy online where it's that much more accessible and now in a state where people kind of are like super free to do anything um, because they don't have those regular um, interruptions the attendance rates at these group therapy um, sessions and salons has been literally near 100 percent versus i'll tell you at stanford in my in my regular stanford clinic um our uh, no-show rates are probably around like 15 to 20 percent if it, like some of like the schizophrenia clinics might be a little bit more uh, intake might be a little bit less but overall it's actually pretty high um, even now, my therapy or my uh, digital one-on-ones, I, I think I've had like one, one missed session of, you know, a few hundred. Um, and, but anyway, back to the group. I think that um, if we think about how are we going to address this moving forward, and in particular, understand the new influx of folks who now are struggling with mental health and want to be able to get that help, um, the group option really makes a lot of sense. Um, and not only, you know, groups where you actually have a trained 
therapist or psychiatrist or clinician, um, but also some of these peer support groups, right? And AA has been a great example of what we've seen the, um, the addic addic addiction substance community in general, um, how they've been able to address things in the wake of COVID um, is a great, a great example. But I think that being able to continue that and have some more personalization, right? Like, um, you know, uh, post, uh, just d different elements of, of disease, whether that's um, something like addiction or um, anything else, to be able to kind of specialize with the people who you most identify with. I think that's going to be something that we see a lot more moving forward. Yeah, I mentioned that the it's interesting when we took our survey that people wanted one on one, and I was surprised to see that the community group was pretty low on the list, but I absolutely believe that community and group therapy works because, as you brought up, uh, AA works really well and we and we've been looking for Arshana and I've been looking for some sort of uh, support group sort of local AA online group and, and we did identify one company supportive that does a lot of these peer groups and so but we haven't really seen it happen uh, and maybe as Alon mentioned now that people are much more uh, be changing their behavior to uh, become used to seeing people online and seeing these Zoom calls, they're going to be more open to these type of group therapy sessions. But I do agree with you too. They also have to be aligned in terms of, uh, it can't just be a general, general group session. It has to be focused on a specific area where people can be like-minded and have those, uh, be able to share experiences that others want to hear. I want to, uh, or similar people want to hear. So David, you talked about partnering with, uh, you talked about lots of partnerships that you're having to be able to, to, uh, I guess, provide access to care. And I'm wondering if, if part of that is also some form of community type groups, local community groups that can uh, be there to service some of your uh, population. Absolutely. There, um, there's a one the first partnership that jumps to mind is uh, with an organization called Blue Sky, where uh, we have partnerships down here in the San Diego area as well as up in the Bay Area. Um, and they provide mental health services for high school age students. Um, almost immediately, they moved to the, um, exactly what you're talking about, these uh, digital group platforms to continue offering these services and have already had over 600 appointments. And so we we're really proud to, um, to be able to extend that arm, particularly to people don't, I mean, oftentimes folks, the conversations usually surround uh, are around adults, but when you really think about the impacts to your kids and teenagers, it's a very distinct, um, but equally as, uh, as impactful, of course. Um, there's an, an, another, um, there's a, another partnership with Do Something uh, that we have that we're also very proud of that's reached out digitally to folks and helped to build these communities. And when I think, um, be, uh, before coming to Blue Shield, I was the, uh, the clinical lead for a national suicide prevention organization for LGBTQ young people. We think about, um, when we're talking about uh, some organizations that are uh, community specific to help people with resilience. And you think about some kids who live in rejecting homes, how very complicated it is to not be able to have any kind of retreat from your parents or your families or whatnot. And, and then you, uh, not that all homes are rejecting, of course, many, many are quite, you know, accepting and resilient, uh, resilience building. But in those homes where you've got the, the, those complications, it's these partnerships who um, act as cultural brokers, uh, whether it's for an LGBTQ community or a Muslim community or, or, or different, uh, different faith communities or different ethnic, ethnic communities where um, being around people who look like you or sound like you or have some similar lived experience as you, um, you, you know, you don't, you don't need people who look like me trying to act like we're able to serve everybody um, and at with the same level of cultural humility and appropriateness um, and understanding. So you, you kind of have to build those those folks out, um, those teams out and your your ability to support them. Sometimes it's financial support, sometimes it's clinical support and, and assistance with quality outcomes. Yeah, and, and I want to second what um, Dr. Vassan was mentioning around scaling of providers. I think that that is a big issue. The bottleneck is uh, provider to patient or demand ratio. And I think Ilan is, is experiencing it too, and David, possibly your, uh, your organization is experiencing it too. So, you know, homogeneous group visits, which is what, um, you know, Dr. Vassan was talking about, like similar condition-based uh, group visits is a, is a great solution. And then at HP, we partnered with Crossover Health that is um, 
a company that we were in it, you know, we were on path to go digital first and we got rushed into going digital first on, on May 14th. And so uh, on March 14th. And um, in that way, most of all of our services, which were behavioral health and physical therapy, chiropractor, primary care, all of those and health coaching became virtual. Um, and then not only virtual with synchronous visits, which is basically you set up an appointment and both the people show up, but also we rolled out asynchronous communication. And that's one way to, to scale our providers is to create almost like texting um, kind of communication uh, with your healthcare provider. In that way, you have a care continuum and not just one-to-one therapy sessions. And that's quite effective um, ways for us to uh, roll that out. We do have, the group visits are quite effective, but what happens is people do not share all of what they need to, uh, to get to a clinical diagnosis and, and treatment planning. So I think they are helpful because you do know that you're not alone. Um, but, uh, but asynchronous uh, visits are quite effective from scaling perspective. So let's bring in Brian. You've been pretty quiet over there. And, and sorry, this is what happens when you do a Zoom call um, when you're home. So my eight-year-old just walked in and so Arsh and I didn't really hear the latter part. <laughs> no, it's okay. I, I, can, I can recite it for your eight-year-old. <laughs> All of you have been on the phone with me know about that. He missed out on my conversation. <laughs> Well, I wanted to bring Brian in a little bit, um, you know, for, for just to find out a little bit about how Brian, you talked about your portfolio companies kind of dealing with, with thinking about thriving and surviving. What are you doing or how are you helping them uh, get through this process? I know you're advising them to, from a financial standpoint, on how to manage their business, but are you off also offering maybe some services that can uh, meet them where they are, they are emotionally? Sure, I mean, I'm, I'm not clinically trained in any way to support them in, in, in the way they should be, um, but a big part of our platform as a firm is about empowering the entrepreneur to have um, the best chances of success. It's sort of uh, creating perfect alignment, right? Like the goal is, um, scaling and building a successful business. And if 80% of our bet is a founder bet, um, what I've come to realize after doing this for 20 years is it's very much about the relationship with the entrepreneur, both investor to entrepreneur, but it's mostly about facilitating the, the leadership skills, the growth skills, the EQ, all the things that uh, contribute to a good and healthy leader. Um, and so I've started putting more of CrossCut's energy behind the emotional health of our founders um, and announced a partnership a couple months ago with a coaching group called Evolution that basically you know, has about 80 coaches on their platform, um, has access to traditionally trained psychiatrists where needed and can basically facilitate whatever is in the best interest of the entrepreneur, with whatever they need to, um, to show up every day and be their best. And so that's a big part of what our investing platform is focused on is finding entrepreneurs that are open to that, not so driven by ego and, and self-confidence that they say, yeah, I need help. Um, just as we do as, as VCs are saying, we don't have all the answers. We need help in our own personal lives. Um, if I can show that to the entrepreneur and then make them more confident that they don't have to thump their chest and pretend that they're killing it, uh, we might actually end up in a better dialogue as a mentor and advisor to the company. So I've brought the Evolution Group in, I've brought the community of CrossCut, um, mostly driven by the, the more forward-thinking companies that are thinking about the em emotional health of founders and the types of resources that are available. And you know, at the end of the day, we're just facilitators. So I could see a community being formed with CrossCut portfolio CEOs coming together I know that we've had these forever in Silicon Valley, those CEO groups, but uh, do you bring them together maybe in a Zoom call with, uh, I'm sorry, Evolution, the, the service you talked about, and do they have group sessions to talk about certain things they're all going through? 
Well, I know Evolution has been doing a lot of group sessions before. Um, I participate in group therapy. I, I, I think it's extremely helpful. Um, I, I think it's more what's happening is the, the strongest leaders that have a background, the strongest founders are actually facilitating these groups themselves. So we see these, and they're mostly on WhatsApp or other platforms. Um, they're just sort of happening naturally, not leveraging any established platforms for it, but really basically saying, I'm here as a resource, what do you need? And then I just see a, a ton of great ideas being shared across these founder groups. And from what I can tell, deep engagement on leveraging them to their benefit at this time. That's great. That's great. And it's great that they're being very proactive about that. Yeah, I, I think what I've seen in the last three or four years, right, is the just the entire stigma around mental health in the entrepreneurial community has diminished dramatically. And, and again, that's that, that Silicon Valley culture um, of killing it or fake it till you make it or uh, all the things that have been driving this entrepreneurial ecosystem for so long. Um, obviously, it's driven by greed. It's driven by trying to have that big win. But at the end of the day, the human side of entrepreneurship is, um, is finally having its, you know, its time uh, to shine where you can be more vulnerable with what you are facing and suffering in your entrepreneurial journey. And I just, I just find it very uplifting to see that happening, not just in LA, but across a lot of the venture ecosystems that we spend time in. So Nina and I actually talked about this the other day about how we're all kind of realizing that, um, that we do struggle, you know, that, that, life is, that life is a struggle and um, we're not immune to that at all. And we, um, you know, this has a way of lowering the stigma at some point, right? As we all realize that we all struggle with our mental health, at least at some points in our lives some greater than others. But as we, as that stigma goes down, as people understand the human condition that we are all struggling and we do struggle, do you see that right now we're, you could say we're in a mental health crisis, but as everyone understands that about their human condition, a year from now, the more people who understand that about their human condition, will we actually see a downturn in what we call a mental health crisis? Do you I would think argue yes. In, I, I would argue in some ways yes. Um, sorry, <laughs> this might not have been meant for me, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in. Um, I would argue yes, and I'll tell you exactly why. Um, whenever I talk about mental health, especially with folks who are kind of new to the field and talk about the challenges, I say that uh, problems one, two, and three are stigma. And I say this because it, uh, one of the biggest issues of mental health is first just the delay in how long it takes people to get treated. On, on average, 11 years from the onset of symptoms to actually seeing a medical provider. And, and that's like good, you know, best case scenario in the US with insurance. Think about like the rest of the world, it's even worse. Um, and so what is happening now is just the openness that we're having um, to talking about struggling with mental health, in particular anxiety. Bambi and I were, were just talking about how the, pretty much like every day in the New York Times now, I see a front page article addressing anxiety. That's never before happened, before maybe like one every month or something. And so the fact that this has really become a part of public discourse in the way that it has, and everyone from you know news broadcasters to your teacher to your best friend are all, all talking about struggling in this way, it really changes stigma and changes the ability for people to talk about what's going on and then get that help. Help. And so those two areas, one being able to talk about it openly with your loved ones, that's a really big thing because that by itself is therapeutic. Um, and then secondly is um, that, you know, being able to then recognize, wait, I need help, I want help, I can get help. Um, if we can start treating mental health earlier, especially with kids and adolescents, but then even anyone across the board gets help earlier, um, that's really going to make, I, I, that, that, the, the, there is still a crisis in that a lot more people are struggling, but I think the severity and um, the time it takes to get better will actually be going down. And I think, I think from the leadership also, so a lot of people from top down, if they start talking about it, in which I see in the enterprise world, um, the vulnerability, Brian mentioned vulnerability. Uh, we had Brene Brown who was brought in, um, who's written books about vulnerability and was brought in at Salesforce conference. And she talked to a very open session around 
how we don't have all the answers and it's okay to say that. So, so when we, we look at leadership, uh, when are we going to open up the, uh, the company? And, and when they come out and say, we don't know that, and I'm also worried and, and it's starting to have those conversation and, and being okay to talk about that. I don't have all the answers and I'm also concerned or worried or anxious. And uh, it starts to break away the stigma uh, of being this perfect employee or being this perfect mother or being this perfect uh, super person at all locations and, and starting to embrace some of that vulnerability. So I do feel that one, the stigma would be gone. And second, the conversations will start happening a lot sooner um, as people tap into their, uh, their um, vulnerability and discomfort uh, around mental health. I think also that um, social media is driven by millennials and Gen Z right now. And we are talking about folks who are very much more, much, much more comfortable in talking about mental health issues and concerns than um, Gen X and, and, and older. And I think that, um, and they're also driving the consumer conversation. Think about, um, I, I was a, when, when I was a young child, nobody wore seatbelts. It just wasn't a thing. And so uh, the, the, public health approach to decreasing motor vehicle accidents started with wearing seatbelts and getting everyone to wear a seatbelt. And the way that the country moved to it is teaching children about the importance of seatbelt safety, and then also teaching children basically how to seatbelt shame their parents into changing their behavior and starting to wear seatbelts. And so parents then started doing it as well. And it's interesting, I believe that this is something that can be attributed to younger generations and their level of comfort and the reduction of stigma in opening up for their parents and older generations and ability to have these conversations that earlier they were um, either incapable or unwilling to or not um, didn't have access to the language to have the conversations about. And I think it is it is somewhat compounded by the fact that there's more social isolation in that age group too. And, and there is almost a silent epidemic of depression anxiety that is happening in that age group too. And it is increased suicidal rate, sadly. So, so there is, hence there is like this matter of survival to have those conversation in that age group. And I'm glad they're having it. Um, I think, I think at least I'm aging myself. I'm, I come from that age group in which, you know, you, you stigma was part of discussion. So for, um, for me to sign up a patient for therapy, it was a lot of effort. <laughs> um, it, and now, you know, I get the younger folks and I say therapy, they're like, where do I sign up? So, so it is ha definitely happening. Yeah. And, and I would think I would actually be curious to, to Dr. Razan, what you might say about this one. There's, there's a huge, there's a big difference in um, like September 11 babies and September 11 children mm -hmm. um, where uh, what happened to parents during September 11 and the post September 11 world for young children growing up and the, and the new level of the new anxieties um, that have come out and what might happen now during like with post COVID babies and post COVID children and what the new reality will be for them growing up and their different kinds of exposures to chronic stresses. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, a, a, you know, there's a big article around uh, children anxi and anxiety in Atlantic that came out around exactly that conversation. I wonder what, what's going to happen to children in Sweden. Um, I, I, th I, think, I think kids in Sweden would be quite uh, fearless <laughs> to any viruses that are coming down the pipeline. <laughs> I, wanna, I wanna mention something as somebody who has four children uh, who's fan eight, who, the one who frequents these Zoom calls and uh, the older ones. But I, I wanna say something about, you know, kids being open to therapy, which I think is great. And I think they should be open to that. But I, I also caution that, you know, what are they learning in therapy? Because it's not just about sitting down and having a therapy session so somebody can listen to your problems. It's really about arming these kids with the tools to cope and move forward. So. We shouldn't want a world in which kids are open to therapy. Uh, I mean, they should be open to speaking to somebody, but I think we should be really cognizant about what they're learning in, at these therapy sessions, um, and and it's and and how they're, you know, what the discussions are, what they're learning uh, to be able to deal going forward. Because I mean, it's not that Alan, I would love you know you to have a business, but 
um, you know, at some point it's, um, you know, the, your success rate is, is getting off, getting these people off these therapy sessions, right? I mean, that's, if you were 100% successful, you would not be in business because everyone would be so, you know, able to cope with their lives. And so I want to, I mean, I think it's great that we're, you know, we're open to this, but I think that one of the challenges for everyone is to understanding what are we actually doing during these therapy sessions? Yeah, well, it's, it's kind of, um, um, and I we hear this a lot. It's like, uh, can you have really a successful dating site? Because if, if you're super successful and matching someone with their love of their life within a week, you don't have a business because it's all subscription based and they turn and they go. Uh, and if, if they, if you don't match them ever, then they're, not satisfied. So obviously there is something uh, that is a good churn, like uh, having someone for therapy for life is, is, is not the goal. Uh, interestingly, um, when we look at our patterns of usage in terms of length of usage on different issues and, and the patterns also of people starting and then stopping and coming back, uh, it's surprisingly similar to um, the data in traditional brick and mortar therapy. So although the, the delivery mechanism is, is different, although it's uh, subscription based, it's online and all that, um, um, it, it takes around the same time and the same pattern of usage offline uh, uh, and online. And we're definitely uh, encouraging people to grow from therapy and the therapists uh, do them themselves. Like we're not trying to force people into eternal service because that's, that's not going to work. Uh, that's the kind of an indication of, of, of failure. But I think the, um, the real challenge is, is not uh, making people addicted to therapy. Uh, the real challenge, uh, the most of our users are coming uh, from exactly what uh, uh, Nina said, is, is people who um, um, for 11 years, I think that that's the, uh, the number she, she, she said, like, they needed this service, uh, they, but they wouldn't go to a therapist, either because it's too expensive, it's too inconvenient, the stigma, uh, it doesn't fit their lifestyle, uh, and, and so forth. So most of the people who come to uh, online therapy and, and BetterHelp come after knowing for a very long time that they need it, but not to a point that they feel comfortable enough to sit on someone's couch. Uh, and when they, uh, and that's why we're so, uh, pushy on, on awareness. So when they see our ad in a billboard or a podcast or, or in their Facebook feed, um, um, they say, yes, I, I knew I needed this. And, and this is an opportunity for me to start in a convenient way. And sometimes it's, it's a segue for them to go also to face to face after. And that's, that's totally fine uh, as well. Um, I, I wish we were uh, in, the, in the real concern uh, of are we pushing therapy too much or are we uh, uh, putting people in therapy that they shouldn't go to. I think oh, oh, there will be some, some of that, but it's a, it's a much, much smaller issue than the issue of people who need to go to therapy, including teens. Uh, they're just not getting the, the care that they need. And, and I think, uh, Bambi, what, what is also happening is we have transitioned from faith-based um, support um, into more nuclear family and more, you know, more and more of the younger generation is more atheist. And so they are, they don't have that existent structure that faith-based had before, but they could reach out to their pastor or other folks to get that kind of support. Now, if we do have therapy-based that initially takes care of the 11 years of neglected mental health condition and then needs a regular maintenance, that's not really, a, you know, addiction of therapy, uh, to therapy, but I think it is just maintenance of uh, mental health uh, thereafter. So when we look at services that we roll out over at um, a large organization like HP, it is very outcome-based. So, so the number of therapy sessions are numbered and we want to see the outcome. Uh, so people are not nonstop lifetime members of a service but they are looking at getting off of that therapy and then following up with maintenance, maybe once a month or once every two months or a quarter um, thereafter. Um, and, and especially in this COVID times, we looked at how we can augment therapy by focusing on sleep. That is one aspect that we are wanting to restore. And we just rolled out a global program with Sleepio, which is from Better, uh, Better Health. Um, that is just restoring sleep. So we give power in the hands of the end user. So they, what they can do 
to build resiliency and sleep is our, our lubricant. Like if we talk about like just like you put oil in your car, uh, in your engine, you need oil in your brain engine and then that's your sleep. And <laughs> you yeah. just need to do that. And everything falls in, in place thereafter. Yeah. I think um I think Arshana is saying empowering the patient that that is that is um what the therapist's job is is to empower them so they can move off the therapist but it's it's fine if they have an ongoing relationship i i have therapists i have therapist friends uh and i like you know i enjoy having conversations and i love talking to you nina but although you're not my therapist but um but so somebody said here in the audience that therapists have a lot of power and they do so i want to switch gears a little and talk a, about some objective biomarkers that it, you know we're seeing new technologies now that can gauge your sweat glands and you know the heat all of those things these things that can indicate whether you're ready to have a, a meltdown or so what are we seeing uh maybe david you know you're you're out there looking at new technologies perhaps brian from the objective biometric uh, technologies out there, what what's looking promising? Yep. So, uh, there's one is the wearable device that is taking some kind of biometric. So um, there's there's one that's um, it's kind of like a Fitbit or a, a, an Apple or like a, a smartwatch, um, and it's measuring pulse and temperature and a couple of other things. And so for people who are subject to panic attacks, for example, um, it is actually, let me back up, it's sort of similar to like the new Apple Watch can detect a fall. So particularly for an older population or someone who might be more susceptible to becoming injured from a fall, it allows, you know, if they're living alone, it allows that to be monitored and you get an instant, um, you know, Siri asks you, it sounds like you have fallen. Are you, you know, are you okay? Do you need help? Do you need a call for, you know, the, your emergency contact or whatnot. And, um, so a similar thing can happen for uh, someone who might be more prone to anxiety attacks or panic attacks. And so um, as these markers go up, um, sometimes when someone is feeling anxiety, they don't even necessarily know that that's what's going on. And it helps almost like the metacognition <laughs> kick in about like, hey, these symptoms that you're experiencing equal, maybe you're experiencing increased anxiety and maybe you should engage in one of these coping strategies that you know it reminds you to engage in a coping strategy to gain more can you know physiological like physiological control over your body or something like that some breathing exercises um interestingly they can also track anxiety so um it, over time so if you like maybe you're meeting with your bosses at four o'clock on Tuesdays and your, your biometric recording and say like hey your anxiety keeps going up during this certain time of the day and maybe maybe there's something you know, like systemic that you might want to address in your life. Um, so those are looking like they're still kind of in their infancy. Like we don't really see a whole lot of solid evidence that they're, you know, we don't have like an evidence-based um, demonstration with randomized control trials that are showing that these things are significantly impactful. But we're definitely seeing an early onset of, of things that are clinically interesting, but not necessarily evidence-based. Um, before I before I cede my camera time, I just wanted to mention one thing before we switch gears, is that um, behavioral health and treat the treatment is not just the responsibility of behavioral health professionals. And one thing that we really are looking to do at Blue Shield is engage non-behavioral health practitioners uh, to be a more holistically integrated uh, uh, practitioner that includes behavioral health. So one, for example, is, is the responsibility of, of OBGYNs to screen for maternal mental health conditions among their patients um, or pediatricians during those initial well baby visits to also screen new mom for postpartum um, behavioral health conditions. So it, it's not just that you would engage with therapy, but to really have a more holistic approach to treating that whole person, knowing that it's you're much more likely to see a PCP than a mental health provider. And for a pregnant woman, she's much more likely to see an OBGYN than a primary care provider. You know, so it, it, you, you want to get where are these folks who might be more susceptible to behavioral health conditions or episodes or challenges um, to get the appropriate screening and get an early detection and intervention and leakage to services uh, that are appropriate and necessary for those folks beyond just your behavioral health network, um, but the person that you have a closer relationship with at the time who can meet you where you are.
And we'll go back to the wearable devices conversation. <laughs> Uh, at David, what's the goal? Lindsay does not like to, she just raised her hand. I think that's for you, David. What's the goal? Lindsay, is that the question? Why don't, do you want to? Uh, yes, that's the question, she said. <laughs> She's on chat. She doesn't want to uh, show herself. Sure. I don't know why. But the question was, what's the goal for the wearable device? And I... Uh... With OBGYN, I don't know. Okay. For for the moms, I think I think you mentioned moms somewhere. Uh, yeah. So um, I, most pregnant women go and have their prenatal visits, and that's their access point to healthcare. So that is where the maternal mental health conditions can be screened for and identified and understood. Um, where they might not access any other kind of health care or and particularly or even considerations about their mental health um, or, or, or if they're whether addressing it, which really can change during pregnancy. So I think the, the issue is um, where you access health care, whether it's, you know, whether it's a, a culturally bound type of health care or like with a doula or whoever it is that you feel comfortable with, and that's your health home that we want to integrate approaching behavioral health or mental health or you know, social relationship health at that point of entry where you have comfort accessing, where many people don't have a level of comfort accessing other levels of health care. No, that's a great point, David. Are you doing that right now? Can you, should, can you note one area where you are in doing that? that that, that's why the, um, the OBGYNs and pediatricians came to mind first, is because um, as of last summer, we're requiring everyone who treats a pregnant woman to screen for maternal mental health conditions. Got it. What happens when they, have, when they find out they do have a mental health condition? And that was Lindsay's question is, mm -hmm. where's the handoff? So then there are, clinical, there are clinical pathways that are dependent upon severity. You've got a lot of OBGYNs, you have a lot of psychiatrists that are very afraid of what happens with pregnant and nursing women about whether they can treat with the same kind of um, antidepressant medications or antipsychotics or whatnot. You've also got folks who are saying, if you are pregnant, go off your antipsychotic during the course of the pregnancy, which can have awful um, outcomes. I don't want this. I am in no way licensed to give any kind of medical advice, so I want to put that at the forefront of this. But if you've got someone who's, uh, and maybe other folks who are licensed to give medical advice can jump in on this one. <laughs> yeah. um, but you know, if you've got someone who has uh, bipolar disorder and subject to manic episodes, it can be very damaging for uh, the for a fetus, and particularly for a, a, a new a young child in the first year of infancy, we can reduce the likelihood of their exposure to adverse childhood experiences when we treat mom. So you don't want to get into uh, uh, or, or give mom the treatment that she needs um, and the family. So uh, with that one, if there is someone who might want to touch a little bit more on, on those pieces, that's when I say the goal of, of, of getting people who are not just behavioral health clinicians to engage in behavioral health work, uh, as it were, with their patients. That's kind of that's where I was talking about that piece. And and I, I think it's a very it's it's a very strong uh, point that you bring in, David. Because what has happened is we have uh, created specialists in silo, mm -hmm. and and the point of entry for the patient has been now restricted to primary care only, mm -hmm. and that that is not right because essentially it is not the condition. Um, it, it, it's the problem that we are treating is more important than the provider that we are picking to treat that problem. So when we are designing our operating system for healthcare, it has to be fluid enough for each of the providers to come in and out in to order to serve the patient. It has to be very, very patient centric and any door of entry, every provider needs to know when to flag this patient so they don't have to wait 11 years to see Nina. And in, and in that way, especially postpartum depression is one of the most neglected. And that essentially leads to the ACE problem that you're talking about in the kids. So it, it's, it's, almost, it's not genetic transfer. It's, it's just you know, the environmental transfer to the child from day one if you do not treat the, the mom who is the core, health, you know, core provider to the child. Um, so it is, it's quite impactful if you train, if we train our healthcare providers, whether it's nurses, doula, whoever is providing, to be able to flag this patient and get to care really quickly. 
I'll add just one quick note of, I, I think one, you're talking within, within the healthcare profession and in addition, you know, like orthopedics, for example, huge amount of mental health there. And so it's recognizing that primary care is already overwhelmed. And so to expect that to be the only venue or, you know, a stream to get mental, for people to be able to get mental health treatment is really not appropriate. It's recognizing that mental health is a, you know, big kind of, uh, it shows up in a lot of different places. And in particular, there is a lot of comorbidity when you are, you know, postpartum or having an orthopedic issue or pain or anything like that. So first, how do we address that within the uh, medical system? And then I think you also, um, Archana, you were bringing up the um, religious and faith-based communities. I think if we look from the community perspective, the two or three probably biggest um, groups that are able to recognize mental health struggles across the whole family are faith-based communities as well as schools and, and, and employers at times for adults as well. And so I think it really draws upon what are those other community resources schools, faiths, and other kind of groups where we can better train um, those folks to be able to identify mental health struggles and then have a good pathway for them to be able to make those referrals. Um, and uh, I'll touch, I finally just touch upon what you were saying, David, I think about um, kids, right? Kids really is still where we need to be focusing. I think that this education piece, doing it within the system is one thing, but really being able to create curriculum and more of this like emo social emotional curriculum that's going on in schools where, you know, in the entire year, you should be learning about this. So you don't have to go to a therapist because like cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, some schools are teaching that now and mindfulness, some schools are teaching that, that now that's amazing. But really, if that if that was like a policy initiative, one of the, you know, senators decided to take up what that would do by getting that curriculum and that education in at an early age would really, really change the ability for people to understand that they're struggling in some way. And and then have the tools and skill set and resilience to actually deal with it themselves. Um, so ultimately, you know, we were talking a few minutes ago about do we need more therapists or do we have therapists for life? Really, we need to just focus on educating people and educating them as early as possible so that the skill sets and the tools are being delivered. Because that's a lot of what therapy is, right? It's learning the, these tools, but sometimes you can do it in an app and sometimes you can do it in a workbook um, and sometimes you can do it in fifth grade. Yeah, since we started with the uh, um, question about biomarkers and wearable, I think David's approach is, is a practical solution to the problem, whereas biomarkers and wearables, and I hope I'm not upsetting people who work on these kind of ventures, are a lot of times not a practical solution. Because if I'm already so much aware to my mental health and my well-being that I'm putting a wearable or a biomarker, I'm probably aware enough to know something about my mental state and my uh, a need for therapy, and I, I, I can know whether I'm depressed or stressed enough to go into, into counseling. Uh, the challenge is the people who are not aware, and this is where uh, uh, health professionals, whether the PCP or uh, uh, others, can help. Um, I would be cautious about solutions of, which are looking for problems, uh, which this is my feeling a lot of times uh, about the um, quantified self, wearables, biomarkers that tell you that you're depressed. You probably, if, if you're at the point that you're using these things, you probably already know that. You know, and I, also, I have to say that I, um, I, I've thought about this quite a bit. So I, I have an Apple Watch. I'm extremely physical. And so, and I always thought, I don't really need to count my steps. But now maybe in my older age, I am counting my steps. And it actually has, has, influenced me somehow and affected my behavior because now I know, oh, I, can, I did 20,000 20, steps. And oh, one day I did 6,000, which, you know, I need to really, I, I want to get back up to the 20,000 steps. So, you know, even though I'm a person that actually understands my, the physical needs, I've actually been, this is actually, um, modified my behavior to some extent. So along the lines of the biomarkers, I do believe and we're all probably very introspective, every single one of us here on the call, as well as everybody who's attending. And we're probably very much in tune with our feelings and emotions. But I do have to, if, if you could imagine and envision a world where you do, and I think David mentioned this, where you have statistics where, boy, you always get angry when you talk to your boss, or you always, and you start seeing these patterns where, you're like, okay, I actually do, I'm starting to feel my levels of anger going up. And you might modify, to some extent, it could modify your behavior. So I think, I think as much as I, I actually feel like I'm in touch with my feelings, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm gonna say that we're a little bit early on in those biomarkers, those bands that sense your emotions, but I think that there's a place for them. 
um, just like these wearables. So anyway, that was- I, I, I just wanna add, I completely agree. I think that most of us are actually pretty bad at identifying what's going on with us or even tracking that. And sleep, Archana is a perfect example, right? Like when they actually look, like we all, in, in psychiatry, we like sleep is first, when sleep goes, it's like one of the earliest signs of pathology in everything from like bipolar to depression, to anxiety, you know, across the To board. diabetes, to hypertension. Right, right, exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the thing is usually like you think, oh, like, did you sleep well? Did you not sleep well? Like you should have a pretty good sense of that. When we actually look at the studies of like when people, think how many hours they slept or even how well they slept and then compare that to the data it's like there's no correlation at all it's like really really bad and we are actually and, and sleep is in some ways more uh, objective than you know than a lot of these other things around emotions like depression like anxiety so i think that there's a nor i completely just echo what you're saying baby i think there's enormous value in what this is but like everyone's saying it's still very early stage there's still a lot of noise in terms of um looking at the data and understanding like specificity sensitivity and what that what we do with it, but it's an enormously powerful area that really will write a lot of the future. So it's it's almost 4.30. We're supposed to be done at 4.30. Nina was speaking a lot faster than she typically does, and she speaks fast, but so clearly it means like she's really trying to get her thoughts in. But we have three questions, and we have somebody on who wants to ask a question, and I have made him, um, I've made him a speaker so Gary, you can ask your question. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. This is Dr. Gary Stein. I'm a retired physician and I have used, uh, and with uh, a long history of having symptoms of anxiety and depression that became especially uh, bad when I retired. I started uh, ACA Adult Children of Alcoholics. It was an offshoot of Al-Anon which then evolved to adult children of alcoholics and dysfunctional family. There was no alcohol in my family, but lots of dysfunction. In any case, I would like to say that it has been, I don't want to use the, mir the miracle word because there are no such things, but I like it and it works. It's 24 seven availability. I belong to a group. I make friends and acquaintances. I can discuss the most intimate details of my life with a sponsor or fellow traveler down the road of recovery. There's no cost if I don't want to pay a $2 uh, meeting contribution to support the rental of the room. And it is widely available. Also, I researched the area. There must be a hundred different 12-step groups available around the country. The point of entry really doesn't matter. Usually, the person is suffering from, I'm not enough, I don't do enough, I don't have enough, and had a traumatic childhood. Whether it's Food Addicts Anonymous, whether it's code, Codependence Anonymous, uh, Workaholics Anonymous, Clutterers Anonymous, etc. Anonymous. It, there are hundreds of them, but they basically go on the same principles and operating procedures as AA. And we saw recently the Cochrane Report, if we all know it, if we've been uh, in the field, but the Cochrane Report said definitively, Alcoholics Anonymous works. And I'm telling you, these other programs also work. They don't work for everybody, but they're still, I think, a very effective therapy. I can say that ACA strongly advocates th themselves as an ancillary to one-to-one -to -one therapy. Um, so that I would just encourage all of you in whatever uh, way that you're now influencing our revolution and acceptance of behavioral problems as a legitimate human uh, disorder state to think in terms of these 12 steps, nonprofit, non-professional, effective therapies. I think uh, uh, a physician who's seeing an alcoholic who doesn't refer them or encourage them to go to AA could be accused of malpractice. I expect that in the next generation, the same might be said for these other 12-step groups. They work. I encourage you to think about them. And I put my phone number there. So if anybody wants to phone me personally, I'd be pleased to receive the phone call. I am retired, a man of leisure. I'm blessed with uh, uh, making more money in retirement than I did practice. So uh, Thanks. Uh, Thanks, I have Gary. 
Yeah, I think I think we all agree AA works, and and thank you for pointing out ACA. And we do believe, you know, it, can we have more of these groups? I think that's what all of us would like to have. Is we need more, and so I think part of our what we're thinking about is how do we enable, how do we how do we use technology to enable more of these and support more of these groups because they have been so effective. So your point is certainly well taken. So we appreciate well, what, that. I'm, what I'm asking and what the barrier. Um, okay, let me, let, we have three more questions. So one for Alon. You spoke about the influx of therapists, applicants, BetterHelp has seen of late. Beyond this recent change, is there a deficit of therapists nationally? How do you scale your platform while maintaining quality for your customers? Yeah, so uh, I think the short answer is no. Uh, unlike psychiatrists, where there's definitely a huge shortage of, of psychiatrists and, and that's that's will be proven and, and probably not going to be fixed soon. Uh, there are half a million therapists, licensed therapists in the US. And if, if you look at the number of people who use uh, therapy, there isn't really a shortage. Uh, but the, the shortage can be local. Like if you're in San Francisco Bay Area, like I am, yes, there is a shortage because the, the consumption is really high. Um, um, and that's one of the good things about online platforms is that they kind of flatten the curve and, or, or make it more of a, a, a liquid marketplace uh, where you can have therapists with different specialties in different places, work with clients in different places and different specialties, uh, uh, at least on the state level, because that's how licensure uh, works. Um, so I don't think there is a, a shortage of, of therapists uh, on, on the national level. Uh, um, keeping the quality is, uh, uh, while scaling, I think one of the good things about the platform that is digital is that you get a lot of feedback from, from consumers in a very direct way. Uh, so, and that definitely helps uh, to do quality control and quality assurance uh, on scale. It's not anecdotal, it's not only just based on complaints, it's based on uh, ongoing interaction with the clients, getting their feedback, getting their ratings, and of course intervening where uh, needed by, by clinical staff. But scaling is, 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 is always tough, uh, not just from quality perspective, but all perspective, but this is what we're uh, experiencing, not just through COVID, but in the last three years. Do you support your therapists to get licensed in most states? especially now that the emergency licensure um, uh, has opened up state borders? Yeah, so uh, unfortunately, the, uh, um, I, I was hoping for therapy to follow what happened in the medical field where basically it's now open for all. And if you're uh, a doctor anywhere in the US, you, you can treat and telehealth pretty much anywhere in the US. Uh, very unfortunately, we talked about this and on the first panel, this yeah. is really not, not happening. It's happening in a very limited way. Uh, and also, unlike medical treatment, therapy is something people want to do for the long term. So if this is like an emergency order, and I know I'm getting matched to a therapist out of my state, but three weeks from now when shelter in place is gone, I would no longer be able to work with this therapist. It's a really bad experience and bad clinical outcome probably to, to start and then need to transition. So we're still, uh, very unfortunately, I think it, I don't think it's, it, it can be justified in, in this environment, but we're still practically in, in a, uh, a situation where it's all state-based and in, in what happened in the medical field doesn't really, uh, it's not really happening in, in the therapy field. What we're seeing is that they are, even though the shelter in place is being uh, lifted up, uh, the medical licensure open it is still going to remain open, possibly until 2021. So, uh, because we are anticipating future waves. So, mm -hmm. so something. I, 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 I wish it would happen also in therapy. Like, if we can lobby for this, let's yeah. do that. Yes. Hey, I, I want to get through these questions. This one's for David. So, David, resonating so resonating with everything you're saying. Are you currently collaborating? with advising any startups and are you open to doing so? Okay, probably not really a question. Uh, I'm assuming you are working with startups, but that's something you can answer, David, in the Q&A. Here's one for, uh, this is for everyone. There's been an acknowledgement of the mental health crisis for adolescents. Blue Sky is providing a public health solution for youth. How are the rest of the adolescent population being served? Schools are doing checking calls and teachers are struggling to teach each remotely. Who feels responsible to serve the segment of the population? I think Nina kind of mentioned, I think everyone sort of mentioned that it, 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 we have to look to all our communities to help with this 
uh, with everyone's mental health. And when Nina mentioned schools, I, I thought of our school and what we have adopted is the school, I think it's called the Zones for Life. And it really does, I, I, I really am grateful for my school to be able to step in and teach the kids, the elementary students, uh, coping skills. So there's different colors and green is you're ready to go, you're at a good level, red maybe, you're kind of angry, not at a great level. And they really teach the kids, how are you feeling and where are you? And so, and I think that that's a type of, those are the type of programs that need to be adopted. More of those programs should be adopted in all schools. Now we go to a parochial school, they go to a parochial school, so that's, you know, they might have a little bit more money than a public school, but I think that's, those are the type of programs, you know, that, that I would like to see more ubiquitously. Uh, I don't know if anybody else wants to respond to, um, how are we addressing the adolescent population? And, uh, and I think it's a great question because I think David, you also mentioned post the post COVID kids, yeah. I mean, the unintended, unintended consequences of their mental health, we don't even know what that is just yet, but um, we certainly are, uh, we're sorry, already struggling with them, you know, those who have been grown up on iPads and, and social media and, and, and all of that. So how are we addressing uh, this population uh, beyond just sending them to therapists? Anyone want to respond to that? Well, I, I would share a perspective from Palo Alto School District, which is, has been in the news quite a bit. Um, we've had a cluster of 11 suicides a couple of years ago. Um, so, and, and all, all in high school, of high functional kids. So quite traumatic for the community. But I would say that since the shelter in place went in place, except for the social isolation bit, which you know, kids have figured out doing Zoom meetings, it has caused quite a bit of relaxation of stress because they are not moving from class to class, do not have so much workload because they, it's actually quantified and limited to three hours a week for each subject. So they are experiencing what my son is experiencing from college level perspective. So he goes to, he's a high schooler, he goes to Foothill College, exactly why I do not, I do not agree with the current healthcare no, or current school system of having eight classes in a day, doing silly work throughout the day, instead deep dive on a subject, become master of this and move on to the next. And colleges do that very effectively and they are much better received by uh, young adults. Um, and that's what is happening right now. The structure of high school has broken into a college style education. And students, especially high school students, are experiencing decrease in the amount of stress that they used to feel in their daily routine, and which is somewhat of a positive um, aspect of, uh, of this COVID fallout. And maybe this could become, uh, I'm hoping this will become the future, at least for Palo Alto School District. Yeah, and I think speaking of somebody who has teens as well, I think that uh, we're all, I'm also seeing that, um, you know, the, the things that defined them in the past don't define them today. And I think that's a big learning curve for them where they see that the things they've taken for granted are actually the things that mean, have value to them. So not just you know the varsity being on the varsity basketball team and being the most popular kid and and so on but um they're putting value into perspective uh this that's the silver lining for some of these kids so maybe you know how do we how are we serving these adolescents we've been served this pandemic um but i think i think uh, in the future i think it's good for us as parents to sort of remember this time and remember how we can maybe, um, you know, not take things away from kids, but at least, you know, remind them of, of what they didn't have and how happy they could still be. Um, anyway, we have to wrap it up. It's 440. Arshana, should we wrap it up the way you wrapped yes. it the last yes. time? Yes, so okay. I'm going to start with Brian. I'm gonna put you back on spot. Uh, so what we were thinking is we would wrap it up 
talking about what you do for your own self, for your own resiliency. Yeah. Um, in the weirdest way, this has been one of those necessary pauses that, you know, a type A personality needs somewhere along their career path. And, um, and so for me, um, it's been a lot of uh, reconnecting with high school and college friends that I don't get to see very often, virtual happy hours, um, and mostly taking a, a morning window that I used to not take uh, to get back to my meditation practice, do some form of yoga or stretching, and even watch the news just to like see what's going on in other parts of the world. Um, I think most of us are just so caught up in our own day to day that sometimes we don't stop and take that breath. So for me, this, my, my own mental health has actually been very much um, supported and enhanced throughout this trying time. What I think is the, 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 the worst part of facing this is the anxiety of the uncertainty of what's to come. And taking it back to the high schoolers, I agree, like my high schooler is way calmer than he normally is, but he's anxious about the implications of what does this mean to get into college and grades going away and uh, athletes that get extra years of, um, of eligibility and affecting the recruiting classes and the trickle down effects of all these things are creating heightened anxiety. Um, that's certainly how I feel is like, what are the, the linking ramifications of every aspect of this? And, um, and that's where my, my mental health issues sit today, but I'm much better off on the normal stuff of just managing my day-to-day -day stress than I have been pre-COVID. Excellent. Um, uh, how about you, Nina? So I also, I'm seeing a question pop up, but I'll answer your, your question yes. first. Um, very much would echo what Brian said. I think that um, mindfulness, gratitude, and exercise have been things that, you know, I, I prescribe to every single patient who comes in. Do I always do it myself? No. And so really making that, and, and all, all three of those actually, and, start, and specifically starting off the morning. Um, when I'm in bed, I'll do mindfulness and gratitude in bed and then get out and start the day with exercise. And, and you know, it's not like that exercise I would love to do. Like I, I usually have a regular tennis group. We're not meeting, but even just being able to do something. Um, I ordered a Peloton after a lot of debate, finally, finally gave in for a Peloton. <laughs> that could have come in, I think, next week. Um, and so, you know, so number one, I think that's been a big thing of um, recognizing just the importance of taking the time to do that. And, and I think what Brian said similarly resonated of like, you know, being very, uh, you know, type A and I'm very extroverted as well. And so this has been um, one really, really hard to not have those, um, you know, not have the kind of social links as before. Um, but I think it's been a real you know, silver lining of all this is that there is a blessing of having to stop and having to pause. And really um, what I found myself doing is really reconsidering a lot of life choices. How am I living my life? Is this what I want moving forward? I, I think that this whole experience has made me really rethink um, certain elements of um, my values are the same, but am I actually living in accordance to my values and seeing that I think there's some changes I want to make in that. That's been um, really helpful. And finally, I think just connection. I um, love, uh, you know, I think hu hu just human connection is so tremendously important. And again, exactly the same as Brian, I've, I've gotten to now reach out to folks who I hadn't talked to in a long time. And like a, a group of friends from college now, we're like doing a, um, a weekly game night. And we graduated college in 2006. It's been a long time, you know? Um, so just things like that, I think. And I, I don't think there would have been an impetus to reconnect with some of these folks at that depth had something like this not happened. Yeah, so great. How about you, Alan? Uh, I, I just feel very, very lucky. And I think we're all lucky that we're able to be busy and productive and, and do things. I think the, the, the big issues are with, uh, you know, if you're an event planner or you're on a restaurant or, or and now you're, you're not just, you know, you're stuck at home, you don't have a lot to do and you're very anxious about your future and probably your income has been affected. So uh, I, I think it's, it's almost a luxury now to think about how we, we cope with uh, the mental health because our challenges, yes, of course, our challenges coming with shelter in place and everything that goes on. Uh, but we're, we're the lucky ones uh, to be able to um, have a purpose in, in maybe now even more than ever. Uh, and that's compared to a lot of people who, who lost their purpose at, at this point and, and they don't even know uh, even when it's coming back. So you exercise gratitude. Yes, in, 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 in a short, yeah. Yes, excellent. How about you, David? 
What's your resiliency hey, um, tool? Yeah, uh, so I, I think to number number one, um, we it took us a couple of weeks, but we limited alcohol to only the weekends and maybe <laughs> two cocktails one night during the week because um, we realized that our recycling when we took it out had a lot of, a lot of wine bottles in it. Um, because it's sort of like you get to the end of the work day and you're like, well, what are you going to do now? But we actually made a decision like um, to, to, to limit that intentionally. Um, just like when I was a trauma therapist, I didn't see a horror movie for 10 years because why would I expose myself to things that are going to increase my anxiety levels on purpose? Um, the, the worst, I don't say, but I think the worst thing that I've had to face is that we were meant to be married next month in Spain and so have had to postpone our wedding for a year. And so um, there's sort of like the, what did I have money spent on and what can I get back? So it's sort of like uh, some of those things that I've had to get back. But I think really um, it's when you take the, 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 the step back moment, reminding yourself to take that step back moment and be like, what? it's not going to be like this forever. Eventually things will change and things will get better. Uh, and that constant, like, this will get better. We will get through this statement. Excellent. And congratulations for your upcoming soon to be wedding. Thanks. It'll be a four year it'll be a four year engagement. Tell my mother that. <laughs> she, 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 she's like, go ahead and get married now anyway. I was like, well, yes. we're okay. <laughs> we can all zoom in. Like, yeah, we'll we'll all join through Zoom. <laughs> the courts are closed, we can't even get a marriage license now. Oh yeah, that's true. That's true. How about you, Mark, if you're still here with us? What's your resiliency tool? Silence? Mark stepped away. <laughs> yes. Bambi yours. So, well, let's see. Besides watching Walking Dead at night with my eight-year-old survivor <laughs> with my 13-year-old and Better Call Saul with my 19-year-old. Um, so I do that on different nights. So they each have a mm -hmm. night with me to watch. It's, it's very relaxing. But, um, so the, one of the things that we did that Nina, you mentioned like, or, or actually you and, uh, Brian talked about these new zoom events that you're doing. Uh, we did a drive by play date. Mm -hmm. We did. So I, we did drive by play dates with, for my eight year old. So we called like about eight of his friends and we had, we just went to each of their houses and just waved and talked to them. And we just had conversations. So it took about two hours to visit everyone, but we had a drive by play date. So I thought that was quite fun. It was, it gave us something yeah. to do. Uh, but I mentioned this, this other uh, last time, and this has become my routine that I absolutely love because being at home with, with my four boys, I'm constantly thinking about who they're going to be when they grow up. And so I'm always thinking about what's gonna happen in the fall when they get through this period. So my big thing is, you know, sort of instilling the sense of agency in them, who they are, the sense of self today and as well as tomorrow. And so the thing that we do quite a bit is we always have dinner at 6 30 so in 10 minutes i have to go in the kitchen and start cooking which i love doing that my little routine and they all have a job and they set the table they clean up they wash the dishes they do everything and and that gives them a sense of purpose and contribution um but the thing that we do before is we always say grace so we always give thanks and and i even have my own gratitude book so I'm actually writing down all of their, you know, all of the things that they're saying, but to give them a sense of purpose, they also have to have had accomplished something that day. So made their bed, you know, any small thing, you know, piano, whatever it is, um, went for a bike ride, found a new hike or walk. Um, so I want to give them that sense of uh, purposefulness as well. Um, and so it's something that they can carry with them and hopefully that that sort of trains them for the new circumstances that we find ourselves in after this is all over. Yeah. So a couple of things that I've done. Uh, one is I actually signed up for um, Stanford art class that um, explores medium uh, every day. So I, I put in like 20 to 30 minutes of exploring different techniques of art. And, and that's quite fulfilling. Um, the second thing is, um, as Bambi knows, I've um, invested in a bike, which, which I'm biking about oh, um, 50 plus miles over the weekends. Um, so that's kind of quite intense and fun. 
and that's with my husband and my son and 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 my friend and so biking by design has a six feet apart <laughs> distancing so so we keep up that distance um and then uh, i have i've stolen that idea from you bambi is uh, to do gratitude at night uh with their family my parents are also here so we do gratitude we do a uh, shared accomplishment and the third thing that we added on is what did you learn and then share that with all of us um, in a in a small snippet so whether my son talked about ikigai um which is kind of finding uh, an aligned purpose in your life and as a concept. And he explained it to all of us uh, a few days ago. So those are, those are things that we're doing around dinner table. That's quite, quite uh, powerful. That's great. Thanks, Arshana. I'm sure everybody, hopefully the, those who stayed on appreciate some of our tips, things that we're going through. And I'm certainly learning from everyone here and getting new tips as well from, from, from the five of you who are here, uh, six of you, oh, I can't even count. Um, okay, so it is time to go, but we have, we are going to come together one other time, May 27th between 12 p.m. and 4 p.m. at different times. So thank you so much panelists for staying a little bit longer than you were supposed to. This went a little, 30 minutes longer. Uh, so we appreciate your time and we appreciate everyone who has called in and who has asked questions. We will put this out as a podcast tomorrow. We'll also put the survey out eventually, probably after May 27th. And um, thanks again and um, stay healthy and stay sane. And safe. Yes. Safe. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.